Tony, some years ago you were the head of the New South Wales Corrective Services Department during a time of intense penal reform. What were you trying to do and why were you trying to do it? Well, the, uh, as to the, what one was trying to do, was first and foremost to render a little bit more civilised uh, the way in which people were detained in those institutions. It seemed, um, even in a society that materially had progressed as much as Australia had, that the practices, including assaults upon prisoners, uh, unnecessary aggravation of, 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 what, of, their, of their, their feelings and so on, that all of this was uh, almost as though it had been handed down directly from the early convict days of this society. So the first and foremost, uh, I, wasn't ad I didn't see the major goal as reformation, unlike most other people, and indeed those who attributed it falsely to me. It was really to try and make sure that in the course of exercising punishment, uh, which is the only honest way to describe it, uh, people came out the back door of these institutions no worse than when they went in the front door. And um, along with that, uh, try and help people to acquire some habits like work, um, try and sort out some of their personal problems if possible with professional staff and so on. But I would say the overriding aim was to be civilised. That's still at odds today. Uh, in, in society pretty largely anyway, it seems. Uh, do you think that things have improved in that regard? Things improved greatly for a couple of years <laughs> because uh, uh, World War Three broke out over this uh, attempt to try and achieve that more civilised state of affairs. Constant industrial turmoil and so on. But so telling had been the official inquiry called the Royal Commission that had preceded the appointment of an unlikely chief screw, like me, um, that for a while people just thought, well, let's hope this is going to bring about some changes that will be of uh, benefit to, to those concerned. But after a while, the, uh, the imagery, uh, the expectations that people had of punishment, I suppose the fear about some of the crimes that put people behind bars, um, really raised the temperature enormously and it was uh, a perilous undertaking reforming the prison system. But yes, I could uh, if, you know, show you 200 uh, recommendations of the Royal Commission that were partially or fully implemented in the space of three years. But of course that was what triggered, <laughs> triggered all the problems we actually were doing things. Um, so my answer would be, it's one of those situations in the world where it's uh, two steps forward, one step back. I, I can see that some of the things that produced enormous tension, like for example, implementing a recommendation that people be kept out of cells till nine o'clock at night. Um, so with a lot of installation of lighting and security measures and so on, that all paled into insignificance with the uh, reaction of people, well, you know, they're getting it better than pensioners. That's a very frequent way of describing the situation. Uh, and the re resistance and reaction of the staff at that time uh, just made some of those developments, and as I say, there are 200 of them, but they affected families, the, the opportunity for the first time in our state for a prisoner to hold a child during a visit, uh, to embrace a partner, uh, open correspondence between those who are in there and uh, the most important people in their lives, um, improvement in the fitness and, uh, and ability of guards to do their job. It was never, a, uh, there was never any equivocation about the fact that it was jail. And I had to face prisoners en masse at times and tell them that. The one thing I, I can't change is you're in here, but we can make it as civilised as we possibly can. I'm curious as to what you learnt about these men, particularly the men. Well, I'd had the advantage uh, in the first year after I, I graduated from university in, in subjects, psychology, uh, social work uh, and so on, 
uh, of my first appointment for a year being at Long Bay Jail in Sydney. The, uh, at the time, one of the very few institutions of that kind that existed. Um, but as I remember, riding out in the tram, <laughs> so that certainly dates me, to the jail for my first day, I wondered what awaited me inside. Um, and within a few days, what I realised was that here I was mixing with a cross-section of uh, basically working background people, uh, not all that unlike my relatives and people I knew. Um, going to work was never a, a, a natural kind of experience to go through those gates and into a world where people were so restricted. But as far as my interpersonal contacts with uh, those who were incarcerated, uh, it was one of um, just beginning to a minor, minor degree to think, well, is there something pretty skewed about a system that fills a place like this with people from the same background? Did you see anything that uh, you could describe as a, a, a a systemic or a thematic issue about those people that were incarcerated that you met. You yes, said they yes. seemed so similar to people mm. outside. Mm. So what was it that made them slightly different? Was it just they got caught doing something? or? Well, I was introduced to a few uh, forms of um, behaviour and tastes <laughs> that were not part of my upbringing. Uh, so it was a very... Uh, uh, learning kind of experience. The, the, uh, as to themes, well, yes, there was a hunger amongst the people that I interacted with to converse in the way that we're conversing at this moment, for an indulgence of the most natural kind of behaviour. There was that communality of background, which at that stage I was still... Uh, rather restricted, I must say, in my critique or criticism of, of the social institutions that might be implicated. But the other, the other thing was the, um, to encounter some people, at least, who were really keen to make uh, this a, a profitable experience for themselves. Um, in other words, put their heads into books and, and learn something. But... I think the, one of the most important things I, I picked up was this, the sort of notion that it seems rather helpful, particularly since I went on to become a parole officer and I started encountering the same people outside of the jail, to, to build up some sense of investment in themselves. Um, I could see great merit in the very early establishment of a working relationship with the, the, the prisoners, um, the cultivation of the encouragement of aspirations for the future and then the partaking of opportunities, whether they were of an academic nature uh, or otherwise, to prepare a path to something better th than this. Now that was all, even, oh, look, I've got to describe myself as being an innocent actually at that stage. I'm talking about somebody 22 years of age and learning rapidly. Uh, about these things. But the other thing I learnt, and which would be extremely important for those caught in difficult situations and those who work with them, was that humour was never very distant from where we, where we were. The number of times in which everyone sort of dropped their, their guard and had a good laugh at something that was happening. Um, well, there were, there were numerous uh, occasions like that. And that, that um, openness to humour, I think, is an extremely important thing for, for everyone concerned. One of the things I'm curious about is whether you uh, found that um, there was... We hear a lot about hierarchy in, mm. amongst uh, offenders in jails yeah. and role modelling and, you know, following example set. Mm. And, of course, there can be for the good or for the bad. Yes. Did you find that that was a factor in, in the way that these that, that jails were run and organised? And Well, 
We had, you see, a, a person in charge who was uh, of the old school and who went by, I'm going to mention his name here, uh, Ned the Rock O'Kelly, as the, 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 the boss of the jail. And ex on first encounter, one thought, well, here's a, a, a man who's been hardened by a lifetime of working in this institution. Um, but he turned out to be a pretty decent fellow. And um, uh, among the odd situations that arose um, from his point of view, there were occasional appeals to him from um, partners of, of prisoners who often seemed, I, I began to notice a pattern that for the first several months of a sentence, there was, uh, if anything, a kind of increased attachment. Oh, I'm going to say woman, although of course, uh, the, the, the range of partners was beyond that, but at that time, that was what I would have encountered and had presented to me. Um, he, he was a lady who um, uh, changed from that disposition of being extremely loving and supportive of her poor husband who was in jail to, uh, I've got these kids, and I remember, remember the phrase today, how many years later, 50 or more years later, he put these... Uh, weights around my neck, by which he meant her, her children, and I'm falling over with the pressure of it all, and he's in here. And various kinds of accusations started to emerge. Um, now, Ned the Rock O'Kelly said, for the first time, Tony, we're going to have a non-custodial officer supervising a visit, and you can use my room. <laughs> <laughs> and he started to, uh, in a rough, sort of way regard me as the, what did he call me, the connubial counsellor <laughs> to, to deal with these matters. And then it, st it stretched a bit to a, a gentleman who, with whom I became very closely involved because he was on parole later, um, who was working in the kit and, and sadly had very wide alter alternations of mood um, from absolute depression and uh, life's not worth living to the most expansive notions of what he'd do and what he did the day he got out of jail by way of purchasing um, new television sets and carpets for the house and so on. Um, it depended on, on how things were going. But Ned the Rocco Kelly said to me, well look, um, uh, this guy's crying so much his tears are spoiling the flavour of the soup in the kitchen. You must take him over and do something about it. So that was the kind of exposure, but there were Rumours at that time, which as far as I'm concerned were later confirmed for me, not so much of the American model of, well, there were certainly people who were tough and you wouldn't cross their path and there were certainly things that happened in jails, maximum security jails, that would uh, make you think twice about going to the shower uh, because of the assaults, sexual, physical assaults, and so on. All of that happened, but I wasn't, I wasn't aware of it being as hierarchical in its nature, just there were some toughs who did what they wanted to do and didn't think twice about it. Um, but then I did discover in some institutions that very weak uh, leaders had secured peace by allowing things to happen, including rape, which um, in exchange for which the, the certain prisoners would then offer to keep things under control. So that's my answer. <laughs> Okay, these experiences have obviously formed a uh, backdrop for a lot of the work that you've done in your career, which has been highly acclaimed. But mm -hmm. I wonder if we can talk a little bit about your own background and, and mm -hmm. your own family. And mm -hmm. when you were growing up, to yes. what extent, um, what did you learn from your father? What are some of the things that you learned from yes. your father? Well, I'd like to preface it by saying that I, I'm here talking with you as a person in his 70s. And I, in retrospect, I see my life as being quite divided into two phases. The phase I was describing, I could be horrified and saddened, but I was far less inclined to see the contribution that the way society is organised as helping to bring those things about. Actually, the most crucial year in my life in terms of forming my views uh, was really about, well, I'll say 1970. I had um, a class at one of the universities, Sydney University, 
um, where I spent a, co a couple of years teaching at that time. And that interaction with that group of people was so electrifying for me that I went from being probably, I would be characterised as a fairly kindly sort of person, social interests and so on, to somebody who was not radicalised, because I never have been, but completely uh, imposed on me a different perspective on problems like uh, crime, a whole range of social issues that are important. So if I go back to the beginning, I was raised in a, a fairly large family, six, six children. Um, I got on quite well with every member of that household, my parents. But in fact, probably I wasn't... Um, I, I developed a great sense of independence at a very early age. Um, it, it, such such uh, things as I undertook, I made the decisions myself, educationally. In fact, on the day I graduated, uh, for the first time, my family members said to me, or my parents said to me, we don't understand what it is, but good on you. <laughs> so, uh, to go from a family of people who were primarily, at that stage, in, involved in car repairs uh, and so on, the one thing I got, major thing I got, was we're in this world to work. <laughs> they were all very hard workers. And I celebrated quite recently um, the, the birthday of an older brother who was beginning to rave on about things I'd been involved in. I said, forget it. <laughs> the energy I brought to those things I acquired from you and my father. So emotionally, I don't know that... It, I mean, I actually had a stronger emotional attachment to a favoured aunt and uncle whom I adored. And if they said something, it had to be right. And who, who were they? Simply living people, uh, not very materialistic, putting great store by their relations with people and their children and so on. So, OK, things went along that way. And then in 1970, I, you know, I also had a few other people I could describe as mentors. One of them was the uh, male supervisor I had as a social work student, a man called Frank Hayes, now deceased. Uh, and I was so taken by the work he was doing, to be honest, I thought of it as manly. I thought of it as a branch of social work where uh, there was a degree of ruggedness and you would interview people not in such circumstances as we're sitting talking to one another today, but up a ladder, on a roof, in a, in a field. And to try and translate what one had learned at university into forms that suited that circumstance, I took an enormous lead from, from Frank, uh, who, to, to my way of thinking, was a good father, good in the degree of attention he gave to his children, a good husband, and big-hearted, but as an ex-serviceman, had a, a sort of... Um, you know, maybe I've expanded on this and I hope to get a chance to say something about that, but a manly way, <laughs> interact in a very manly way with people. Um, he wasn't fearful. That was also part of what impressed me. And he was scholarly. So he had a lot of different hmm. qualities. I mean, this hmm. is what I was going to ask you about. Hmm. What were some of the things that, for example, your aunt and uncle if you could identify why they were mentors and why you thought so highly of them. Um, they were a, a wonderful a team. And in some respects, uh, Eileen anticipated ideas which are now in, in cur great currency. Um, she took the view that, um, well, she had a brain. <laughs> She wasn't going to be too aggressive about things, although she could be uh, if somebody was trying to take her down. Or uh, uh, I remember incidents like in shops and so on where people were either disrespectful or um, cheating, and she she stopped them on the spot. 
but she was uh, she combined those qualities of um, being thoughtful, uh, free, with um, a lovingness that impressed me enormously. And I think I've, for most of my remainder of my life, I've put her and what she symbolised by way of her version of femininity on the pedestal. Mm. Can you, bearing in mind that you've had such a wonderful range of experiences mm. with human beings, are you able to articulate what, uh, what toughness, what male toughness might be? What, well, what, again, obviously yeah. various meanings of it, but I yeah. mean, how would, you know, you use the word rugged, for example. Yes, yes. Well, you see, uh, again, I have to acknowledge that I was... Um, in some ways unthinking about it uh, in the earlier stages of my life. Um, I attended um, Christian schools. That was the, the wish of my parents. I've sent my own children to, to public schools. I better say that, and it's true. But the, uh, the ruggedness took the form of being good at sport, and I was. I was a state-level athlete, a footballer. I played for university on a few occasions, um, all of that, and un uh, being unafraid, copying physical injuries, all of that was part of it, and I, I went comfortably with that. Uh, perhaps I even saw virtue in it. Um, and later, it began, the, the notion of, 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 of being a man started to take on uh, other dimensions. Now, I, I think, like men of my age, some of that was, you know, being educated by women who were seeking uh, a, a more, obviously, more expansive role, um, more leadership role and so on, and we used the shorthand feminism, but that was certainly happening. and. Like other people of my generation, I think I was inducted into into thinking differently. But, but at the same time, uh, as I started to think more about what social justice entailed, and the opportunities that should be afforded to everybody to to be what they were destined to be, not what they were destined to be, what they could be. Um, I started to become less bossy as part of masculinity, although reserving for certain occasions, particularly in the prisons, uh, the right to do so, um, to put more store by um, the equality of the sexes. Absolutely, yes, that's all been part of it, with occasional failings. Um, to, 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 feel, to feel good about supporting a range of people, children, from children, uh, adult women, girls, to be ambitious. I have a granddaughter at the moment who, if anyone's my boss, she is, um, because I idolise her. But I do all I can to support her in her ambitions. Now, is that making sense to you? Yes, I mean, what I'm getting from this is that there is a complexity mm. to this notion of manhood. You know, mm. Mm. it's not a simplistic uh, thing of being one thing or the other. It's yeah. being all of those things, being yes. rugged on the one hand, sensitive on the other, yes. thinking uh, as well as doing. Yes, uh, and, and remembering that there are occasions when you have to stick your neck out, and one thinks of that as being linked to the uh, more traditional notions of, of, of being a man. I mean, we take the prisons. On one occasion I had to go um, alone into a, a, a yard with several hundred people who were in a, you could say, riotous frame of mind. And I decided that the choice was between using some sort of force or going and saying, what the hell's all this about? And we'll all sit down while we talk. Uh, I didn't know whether I'd 
will be done over another occasion. Nobody else was willing to do it, but I had to go into a, a, a cell block where women were threatening to set fire to themselves and spend a whole night talking them out of it, believing that at any moment we could all go up in smoke. But all of that is part of, uh, part of my concept, that a man should be willing and able to do that. But who's to say women wouldn't do it equally well? I don't of know. course, of course. <laughs> Courage and, and belief in your own mm, mm, beliefs. Mm. I wonder though, I'm curious, you said that this was a, a, a seminal time for you, 1970 at Sydney mm, University. I, I wonder if you could expand on why and what well, it was. Well, because prior to that time, I enjoyed friendly relations with students at, another, at the University of New South Wales and with students at Sydney. But um, a lot of my teaching was coming out of books. And I just happened to strike a, a grouping of people who would follow every presentation with a field exercise of their own design to put to the test whether that was nonsense or not. Now, I could entertain you with some of the things they did, but not on the entertainment scale, but uh, here we were talking about um, abortion as a, a social issue. And one of the students went from the classroom to interview a woman who that day was having an abortion, came back and played the, the tape in the classroom. Here was another occasion where we were discussing the manufacture of news and the guy said, I'm going down to do a shift at the ABC, listen to the news at lunchtime on Sunday and you will hear that uh, uh, well, you know, an academic at Sydney University has said this, this, this and this. <laughs> the whole year was devoted to, the, you know, I, I, I could no longer... Um, well, the other thing is that at the same time, uh, we're talking about a period when there were protests against Australia's involvement in the war in Vietnam. Now, I, I, I found great discomfort, as I said to a visiting American scholar, uh, in sitting under the North Vietnamese flag while they talked about this. But uh, no, I wasn't too happy about that at all. And no, I wouldn't be going in the demonstration. But I walked over to a railing and looked out and I saw police shoving and pushing some of my students. And emotionally, I, that was it. I went down and joined them and got shoved and pushed. Um, so you can see there was a, a, a compressed number of very interesting experiences that made me more and more aware of the complicity of social arrangements in um, the creation uh, of things that we, we describe as problems in society. Now, um, that has stayed with me to the point where my most singular passion at the moment arises from the fact that having been the chief screw and having been head of an inquiry into public education, I could be meeting little children age four, just as my granddaughter had been, but who hardly had a word to the, that they possessed, who were just being set up to become the fodder for societal institutions later on. So, I mean, just explain a little bit. Just well, well, because if you don't, um, if if from the day you turn up at school, uh, preschool, you um, don't know anything. You've never held a pencil in your hand or a book. Don't even know what a book is. I mean, I start to meet these children, and I just had the strong conviction that I was visiting the springs mm. of that disadvantage, which accumulates from that point onwards because. If you haven't caught up by the time you're in year three of primary school, I met the kids, you know, and the parents and so on, and it was downhill all the way. You escape from a horrible situation where you're made to look foolish, and before you know where you are, these are all studies that I've been involved in, you're making ends meet by theft or drug dealing or whatever else, and, um, and so those sorts of experiences around 1970 uh, opened my mind and my eyes to, to those possibilities. 
So your interest now is, is, is really to try and, if I can just paraphrase it and tell me if I'm wrong, but is, you're really looking at the very beginnings mm. of where mm. individuals are, if you like, they're, they're victims of, a, of, a, of an environment. Mm. They are victims in the sense that they are not able to help themselves at that age. That's right. And they, yes. they then gradually become disillusioned, well, disenfranchised and, and powerless mm. and not in control of and their and, and, you know, then they're prime candidates for a whole range of the... Predators. Uh, yeah, predators, but also the, uh, the assortment of containing institutions that we have, whether it's juvenile justice or uh, uh, psychiatric um, uh, institutions. And, and more obviously the prisons. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, on, on one occasion, since we're talking about critical moments, I asked myself, uh, post my time in in the prison system, I was copying at left, right, and centre from uh, ministers of the day for urging certain courses of action. I asked myself. Where did this? Where did I? Why am I? In, I I'm, why am I in this situation? Where did all this start? And I decided uh, that I'd been taught that society ran along certain, in accordance with certain principles, uh, and and yet I was encountering hypocrisy after hypocrisy, because if those little children, I'm moving around temp in time here, but. If those little children uh, can't attract the extra assistance that they're going to need to try and narrow the gap, then you know it's just hypocrisy to be talking about um, fair go, one of the foundational values that is said of our society. Um, so anyway, I got on the phone. Uh, my, my answer to my own question was, I got this from my teachers who happen to be brothers uh, and who, for whom I have absolute respect and friendship today, all these years later, those that are still alive. Um, so I'm not, you know, they, they, they imparted good principles, good thoughts, good, good ideas. But I, I got on, I sent a, what did I do? I sent a, a, a telegram at the time, or was it an email? It might have been an email at that stage, to the Cardinal Archbishop of Sydney and said, <laughs> Listen to the news. I'm copying it left, right, and centre, and I reckon it was the Catholic upbringing that I had that that's uh, behind all this. And I got a phone call immediately from the Cardinal Archbishop, and subsequently visited him, and we had a, a discussion about things. Well, it doesn't matter what we what conclusions we reach, but um, you know, I, my my message, I think, would be to others who might listen to this discussion is don't let those wonderful moments pass. They, they are absolutely, if life has meaning, if life offers satisfactions, you've got to grab, that's being manly, grab those opportunities and reflect on them and act on them. Does that make sense to you? It mm. does. And, and what you're talking about, this, the, the, the basic set of values that you learned mm. from the brothers yes. at school. Mm. It, you were talking about the school, but you were talking about the values, not, not mm. the lessons. I mean, they yeah. were really, well, it was the values that were as important. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. Um, I think the people who have been most influential in, in at least eliciting the best things I can do, there are plenty of shortcomings, um, are people who possibly wouldn't um, be in the alpha category on the intelligence scale, but are just good, decent human beings. Although, I might just check myself there because as far as Frank was concerned, Frank Hayes was concerned, and he might still be remembered by some of the people who will see this, uh, he reckoned you should be able, to, as, as a professional person, you could combine good values with constantly tuning up your brain. And uh, 
Frank set a, an excellent example in that respect, always keeping abreast of journals and so on, and yet labouring in the field that he did uh, with great intensity. I'd like to just go back uh, to talk about your family again a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. I'm particularly interested in when, because as a father, and now as a grandfather, but mm. more, more especially as a father, mm. how did you, how have you, because no, the children are grown up, but, but mm. the, most of the parenting is over. Yes. How did you approach parenting? What were the things that you kind of used as a yardstick for how you stood as an example to your children? Well, I, I subscribed to the view that um, even at that stage, which, which was pretty early, you know, looking back at it from the vantage point of being in my 70s, uh, of providing a pretty reasonably strong uh, set of expectations with respect to their schooling, with respect to behaviour. Um, my, my failings in that regard were probably the busyness with which I engaged in all these different jobs I've had. Uh, if I look back now, I, I should have devoted, devoted even more time, but it wasn't too bad. I mean, uh, plenty of outings, uh, reading of books, and so on. I just think, on balance, it would have been even better if I'd given more time. I don't know whether I'm answering your question. Well, you, you, you partly, but mm. seeing that we've just been talking about mm. the importance of values that mm. you learned, mm. I was wondering whether you had a, did you make a conscious effort to convey values or, or did that happen sort of you feel automatically? Yeah, I think it happened automatically. Um, By the way you behaved as an example? Yes. Um, I think, I think, well, I mean, how do you impart values? Uh, the most, at one level you can talk about things, at the other level you can try and act it out. And in so far as I, for example, acquired very strong, um, some would say, uh, addictive devotion to work, <laughs> uh, that I don't remember ever having had a conversation with my father or my uh, other family members about it. It was just, that's how it's done, mate. <laughs> you go and do it. And we would work at the weekend, for example, uh, every, one, one, one day every weekend. For a number of years, I would uh, work with my father on um, a particular project, which we don't need to go into, but it had to do with cars and so on. I would... Um, uh, work with my brother who was established who had established a business to to go and get deliveries and so on that I, th I think um, in the same way um, my, my offspring would have seen a concern which they both have now for uh, fairness uh, compassion these things, I think, were displayed before them. Hmm. A little bit about your relationship. It's embarrassing talking about I know, that I know, I know. you don't want to make out you're holier than uh, holy, <laughs> and I, I don't want to create that impression for me. That, no, we'll, we'll find something to yeah. break mm -hmm. that down. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, um, just, mm -hmm. just to finish on these mm -hmm. relationships, the question of relationships with, with women, mm -hmm. mother, wife, daughter, mm -hmm. How would you characterise? I, I would have characterised the earlier stage as um, uh, an implicit um, uh, superiority of power. <laughs> to be honest, that's what you I mean. Theirs? Up. No, mine. Oh, yours. <laughs> well, an assumption. You know, I mean, in other words, uh, that which is so radically altered. I hope in society in later later decades. No, I think at the beginning, but progressively, um, um, I think I've reached a point where I more than regard uh, 
women and men as being equal, I do think I've put women on a pedestal now. Um, Which you didn't before. No, 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 I didn't. I would have been at least slightly, the, well, not even necessarily slightly the other way, but now I see the, um, the attentiveness, the empathetic skills of most women, regardless of whether they'd ever used that word or not, but, you know, being able to read other people's feelings and emotions combined with the obvious evidence that they're no, in no way deficient intellectually. Mm. Uh, one of the things I've done in recent years is go around awarding prizes at the end of year in schools. I still get some of those invitations and I occasionally um, would like to see a, a, a male come up and, <laughs> and get one. <laughs> but the old division between subjects that uh, boys and men need to know on the science side, no, it's all well, maths, it's all finished, isn't it? Mm. So I think, um, y you know, you don't stop and think about it consciously, but I think, if anything, I'd be going the, in the other direction now. Mm. Were you able to give any fatherly advice to your daughter as she was going through her teens? There were lots of conversations. Um, I think I do much better with uh, my now growing up granddaughters. Yes, in fact, I must have improved in that respect because the parents <laughs> sent them to me to have a conversation. <laughs> I don't think that was necessarily uh, I, that that's descriptive of the earlier stage. But but um, no, I, I'm a, a slight, somewhat. Re you talk about prison reform. I'm a slightly reformed character myself. <laughs> that's good to hear. <laughs> Much needed. Thanks very much. Okay, all right.